This video lecture is entitled Introduction to the Last Things. And this lecture is for the East Asia School of Theology. Um, and it's for the Theology 2 class. When will the end of the world come? This is a question that has fascinated countless people throughout history. I'm sure you've wondered about this question on at one time or another. I certainly have. When I was in middle school and high school, I read almost all of Hal Lindsey's books on Bible prophecy, including The Late Great Planet Earth, The Terminal Generation, and There's a New World Coming. And as I read these books, I became familiar with Bible prophecy. And these books created within me an expectation that Jesus would come again soon. But as the years went by, I noticed that Jesus has not come back yet. And so I began to um, reassess my, reconsider my ideas about Jesus' second coming. And this is a struggle that Christians have had for thousands of years throughout Christian history because every generation of believers has had the expectation that they would be the generation that would see the return, the glorious return of Jesus. And yet Jesus has not come back yet. So how should we understand the Bible's prophecies about Jesus' second coming? Well, in this lecture, we're going to try to find some perspective on this issue that will help us to better understand the Bible's teachings about the last things and to help us to better navigate how we should discuss and teach this issue in the Christian community. So why should we teach about the last thing? Well, there are several reasons why we should teach the last things in our Christian community. And there are several reasons why we ourselves should study the last thing. The first reason is because studying the last things gives us hope because the Bible says that Called Jesus' return, the bless our blessed hope. A second reason why we should study and teach on the last things is because it will provide us with comfort and encouragement. And this has been especially true uh, for those Christians who have suffered for their faith. Um, throughout Christian history, Christians have suffered because of their faith in Jesus. And one thing that has enabled them to endure their suffering is this blessed hope that we have of Jesus' second coming. Because Jesus' second coming means that all the injustices that we see in this world will one day be put to right that one day we will have perfect peace and perfect justice. And that is a source of great comfort and great encouragement to Christians throughout the ages. Another reason why we should study and teach about the last things is because it helps us to be better prepared for Jesus' second coming. This helps us to be ready for his second coming. Um, there are several places um, in the Bible where it warns us to be ready for Jesus' return. Jesus himself warns us that we should be ready, that we should watch and pray so that his coming will not catch us unaware. Yet another reason why we should 
study and teach the last things is because it helps us to remain faithful and it helps us to persevere in our Christian walk. Um, we all face challenges in our Christian lives. And the blessed hope, the promise of eternity, the promise of Jesus' second coming, and the promise of his coming kingdom can give us encouragement to remain faithful and to persevere no matter what happens. Another reason why it is important to study and teach the last things is to avoid being deceived. Uh, Jesus warned us that before he returns, that there will be many coming in his name who will try to deceive many. And there will be false Christ and false prophets. Um, he also warned us that many will come saying, Jesus has already come, or his coming is soon, and we are not to be deceived. And so when we, as we studied the last things, we are able to have a clearer understanding of what exactly the signs are of Jesus' coming return. And that, in turn, can help us to be on our guard against false teaching. Warning is another reason why we should study and teach the last things. Um, they, the, when we, as we study the last things, we are warned by the Bible to keep our lives pure, to guard our hearts, uh, to remain faithful, and to be on our guard against those who seek to deceive us. And there is the warning that we do not know when Jesus is coming back. So we should always be ready. And for those who do not yet know Jesus, this is a warning that they need to get right with Jesus, that they need to come to faith in Jesus before it is too late. Because when Jesus returns, it will be too late for those who do not yet believe in Jesus, because then at that moment, their doom will be sealed forever. And so the last thing is a, is a great warning to all people. It's a warning to us believers to be ready for his coming, but it's also a warning for those who are not believers to come to faith in Jesus soon, because we do not know when he will return. He is coming like a thief in the night. And finally, another bit, a last biblical purpose for studying and teaching the last things is because it can encourage us to practice holy living. Now, we, we want to live holy lives not to gain not to gain favor with God, not so that we can earn our way into heaven, but so that we will be more like Jesus, so that we will experience more fully the abundant life that Jesus promises us. And holy living is also one way that we can express our thanksgiving to Jesus for the incredible gift of eternal life that he has given us. So there are several reasons or biblical purposes for studying and teaching the last things. Now, another reason why we should study and teach the last things, because as we study the last things, we are the character of God is revealed. His character is revealed all throughout the Bible, including in the biblical teachings on the last things. So some of the things that we learn about God's character as we study the last things are include the, 
the truth that God is in ultimate control of all people, all nations, and all of history. No matter what happens, God is still on his throne, and he is still in control of all things. So no matter what we see happening in our world, whether it be pandemic, wars, earthquakes, um, economic chaos, or um, political unrest, or even political oppression, we know that God is still sitting on his throne. And this is one of the great encouragements that we can gain as we study the last things. Another thing that we can um, affirm about God's character as we study the last things is that God knows the future. Because as we study the last things, we are studying what will happen, what will come to pass. And it is such a uh, wonderful comfort to know that God already knows the future. He knows how this story will end. And we can rest in that knowledge that the, we know how this story will end too, because he has revealed to us how it will end. And then another, a third thing about God's character that is revealed through the study of the last things is that God will ultimately judge all unrighteousness and injustice. Um, one of the things that causes great uh, distress and great pain on earth is all the unrighteousness and all the injustices that we see daily. You know, we see it in our lives, we see it in the news, um, and many of these injustices can cause us to feel great grief. So, and the, the truth is, many people, when they see these injustices, it causes them to question God's goodness, or even to question whether God exists at all. But as we study the last thing, we come to understand that God will judge all wrongdoing, and he will judge all injustice. And there is a day when there will be perfect righteousness and perfect justice. And that is a great comfort to us. And this is one of the great blessings that we can receive as we study the last thing. We also, as we study the last things, we also discover more of the purposes of God. Um, this includes the fact that evil will never ultimately triumph over good. This also includes the fact, the truth that Jesus Christ is central to the purposes and plans of God. The last thing teaches us that all people will stand before God and be judged fairly. We also learn that believers will be rewarded for their faithful obedience, that there will be serious struggle and conflict in the process, but we are commanded to remain faithful to the end, no matter what. We also discovered that evangelism is a critical part of God's plan for humanity, because in the teachings of the last thing, we, we discover that there will be great evangelism as Jesus' return draws near. And this is also part of God's everlasting purposes for humanity. He desires that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so evangelism is a critical part of God's plan for humanity. We also learn that the final state, that is what happens to us after we die, 
the final state involves the blessing and vindication of the righteous and the punishment and condemnation of the wicked. Because the last things, um, one of the things it tells us is that there will be a day of judgment when every single one of us will stand before God and give an account of our actions and our words and even our thoughts. And God will judge us and he will send his believers to heaven and those who refuse to believe in him will be sent to hell. So these are some of the purposes of God that are revealed through the Bible's teaching on the last things. Now, there are some dangers in um, learning, teaching, and preaching about the last things. One of these dangers is the danger of making predictions. Now, this slide shows a, um, a uh, newspaper that was printed by the followers of a man named Miller, Mr. Miller. And this was part of the Millerite movement, which gave birth to the Latter-day, I mean, not the Latter-day Saints, but the Seventh-day Adventist movement. Now, in the 1840s, this, Mr. Miller in America was preaching that Jesus would return in 1843. And he actually set a date for Jesus' return. And so uh, many people were very, became very excited about this because they said, oh, Jesus is coming back. And so many people actually began selling their homes, their worldly goods, and they went up on mountainsides to wait for Jesus' return. And then, of course, what happened? Jesus did not return. And so Mr. Miller did some recalculations and he said, oh, I made a mistake. His return is actually six months later. And then when that didn't happen, he made one more prediction. And he said, oh, Jesus is returning in 1844. And then of course, Jesus did not return then. And this became known as the great disappointment. And so when we set dates, for Jesus' return, that can initially make many people very excited, but it, it's also very dangerous because when Jesus does not come back on the date that we say he will, many people will be disappointed. They will lose faith in us, and they might even lose faith in, in Jesus um, because they will say, well, you're supposed to be a man of God, a woman of God, and what you said was wrong. Why should I believe you? Why should I believe any person of God? So this is one of the great dangers of teaching, of studying, teaching, and preaching about the late, the last things. Another danger is setting date. Just as, just like I said, um, many, um, when we set dates, this can cause people to become very disappointed. And this is something that happened not only in the 1840s, but this is something that has happened again and again and again throughout history. Many, many attempts have been made to make set a date for Jesus' return. Um, Jehovah's Witnesses among them, they have set many dates for Jesus' return, and each time those dates have failed, been wrong. Um, if you want to find out more about the people and predictions that have been made about Jesus' return, 
I suggest that you go to Wikipedia or Google and look up um, dates for Jesus's return. And you will be amazed at just how many people have set dates for Jesus's return and just how many people have been wrong. So this is one of the great dangers of, of, that comes with studying the last day. And so that's why we need to have a um, more of an open attitude toward Jesus's return. Um, so for myself, I, this is why I take a wait and see attitude. I do believe that Jesus could return in our generation, but I know that I could be wrong. Um, Jesus might delay his return for 100 years, 200 years, 300 years, 500 years or more. We do not, we simply do not know when Jesus will return. Now, this leads us to another danger in um, the study of the last things, and that is the danger of identifying the Antichrist. Um, many, just as many, many people have tried to set dates for when Jesus will return, so also many, many people have tried to identify the Antichrist. And they've come up with all kinds of candidates for the Antichrist. Um, many have identified the Pope as the Antichrist. Um, this was especially true during and after the Protestant Reformation. Um, some people identified Napoleon as the Antichrist. Some people said, no, Hitler is the Antichrist. Some people identified Mikhail Gorbachev of the Soviet Union as the Antichrist. And, you know, they said, look at his head, you know, because Mikhail Gorbachev has this prominent birthmark on his head. And they said, look, see, that's the mark of the Antichrist. Because in Revelation, it says that the Antichrist will suffer a head wound will die and then will come back to life, right? So isn't this evidence that Mikhail Gorbachev is the Antichrist? And now some are wondering if Vladimir Putin of Russia is the Antichrist. So this is another danger of the study of the last thing, identifying the Antichrist. And again, just like with the second, the date of the second coming, we simply don't know yet who the Antichrist is. So we should be very cautious in trying to identify the Antichrist. In fact, it would probably be best not to identify the Antichrist at all at this point in time. Another and and in going going together with these um, dangers of setting dates and identifying the antichrist is the danger of focusing on current events. Uh, this is some this is a common practice among many Bible teachers, uh, many Bible prophecy teachers, and uh, over the years, and that is trying to connect current event with what the Bible teaches about the last days, about the last things. Um, for example, every time there is a major war, um, people try to find some way of connecting that with Bible prophecy. So for example, back in the 1967-6 um, day war, um, Bible prophecy Teachers were trying to connect that war with the last, with the Bible teachings on the last days, because hey, this was happening in Jerusalem. This was the war happening in Israel itself. And you know, many people believe that Israel has a central place in Bible prophecy. 
So anything that happens with Israel is going to ring people's alarm bells. Um, today, um, during the past two years, we've had um, things have just been crazy. Uh, we've had this pandemic for the past two years, and now we have this war in Ukraine. And so there are people who are trying to connect these events with, with Bible prophecy, you know, saying, hey, this, this COVID-19 is part of the four horsemen. You know, we're, we're seeing plagues, um, pestilences in various places. Um, this war in Ukraine is, you know, it, it's Russia that's invading Ukraine. So is this a prelude to Russia's invasion, coming invasion of Israel? Um, so this is the danger that we have of focusing on current events. And the reason why this is such a danger is because we simply aren't God. We simply don't know how everything will play out. Yes, the Bible has told us what will happen in the last days, but the Bible's teachings on the last days are such that we, with our finite mind, cannot really figure out exactly how all the pieces will fit together. And so this is why it is dangerous to focus on current events and as we teach about the last things. Still, um, Now, another danger in teaching about the last things is uh, the tension between present-oriented and future-oriented living. So let me explain what I mean by this. Uh, we should not get caught living as if Jesus will be coming in the next year and forget to live as if he may not come in our lifetime. Uh, we should consider 2 Thessalonians 3, 10 through 13. And so what we need, what this means is we need to live as though Jesus will come back tomorrow, even the next second. But at the same time, we need to live as if Jesus will not come back in our own lifetime. And so this this creates a great tension between expecting being ready for his coming at any moment and living our lives in as if, you know, as if Jesus might not come back for many years yet. So one, there is an essay that I strongly, highly recommend that was written by C.S. Lewis that addresses this tension. And it's called Living in the Nuclear Age. Living in the Nuclear Age. Um, you can also find it on YouTube um, as, a, as a kind of doodle lecture. Um, and it is an excellent essay because C.S. Lewis addresses exactly this um, tension that we all have to live with as believers. Because, you know, while we want to we live with that tension, we also need to ask ourselves, if Jesus came today, could I face him without shame? Would sitting in this classroom you know, would, would sitting in our classroom um, be considered a waste of time and money? Why or why not? And I want you to think about this question because this is one of the questions I will ask you in our discussion board. Is going to East a waste of your time and money in light of the possibility that Jesus could come back at any moment.
one one more danger I want to mention that comes from um, studying, teaching, and preaching about the last things is the danger of speculative dogmatism. Um, you know, as we study the last things, it is fun to speculate. It's fun to say, hey, you know, well, maybe this might be a sign of the end, you know, and, and especially as we read the news, as we listen to the news, uh, we might say, oh, wow, this might be uh, the doorway to Jesus' second coming. Um, so that can be fun, but we need, when, when we do that, we need to clearly identify it as speculation. Um, You can speculate, but call it speculation without embarrassment, okay? There's, and there's no need to be dogmatic when there is a definite lack of clarity in the scriptural testimony on this subject. Because the truth is, the Bible is not 100% clear on this subject. God has given us enough knowledge for us to be prepared for us to be warned that we need to live the kind of life that he wants us to live. But it does not give us such clear information that we know exactly when Jesus is coming back, or that we can know the exact sequence of events that will, that will lead up to his return. And then one final danger. Yes, there is one final danger in preaching and teaching about the last things, and that is avoiding teaching, preaching on the last things altogether. Because the temptation is that, you know, we, we there, there is so much debate and even controversy about the Bible's teachings on the last things, that some people are tempted not to preach on them at all because they want to avoid controversy and they want to avoid possibly creating division within their congregation. But if we do that, then we are neglecting an important part of biblical teaching. And because this is our blessed hope. So while we need to be careful about how we teach about the last things, we should not let the possibility of controversy or the possibility of debate scare us from preaching on it and teaching on it. Um, in fact, there are some places in the world where churches are legally banned from teaching about the last things, especially in China. Uh, right now, China prohibits their churches from teaching on the last things. And there is a reason for that. So let's not be afraid to teach and preach about the last things. So now that we understand some of these dangers, how should we preach and teach on the last things? Um, I'm going to talk about how we can do this on a personal level and how we can do this on a corporate level. So personally, we need to carefully think through where we stand on the last things. You know, you need to carefully think through where you stand on these different issues. You know, are you pre-millennialist? Are you post-millennialist? Are you amillennialist? And why? Why do you fall where you do on these issues? Are you pre-tribulationist? You know, do you believe in a pre-tribulation rapture? Do you believe in a mid-tribulation rapture? 
or do you believe in a post-tribulation rapture? And why do you believe that? Um, you know, so study for yourself, figure out where you stand yourself on these issues and figure out why you stand where you do on these issues. And then after you've done that, you should continue to study various perspectives so that you can understand the strengths and weaknesses of your own position and other people's positions. And, you know, we want to understand all these different positions because at various times in our Christian walks and in our Christian ministries, we will encounter people who have different opinions about the last things. And so if we can understand what these positions are, then that can help us to minister to other people uh, more effectively because we can understand not only what they believe, but why they believe these things. And then with that understanding, we can then be in a position to give them constructive, you know, to talk with them in a constructive manner on the on this issue. So as you study, continue to study, you should also be willing to adjust your perspective in the light of your ongoing study. Um, you should make sure that your position is rigorously grounded in the whole word of God, not just certain portions or parts of the Bible. Because, um, you know, if you, if you rely on just one book or one section or one part of the Bible in your understanding of the last things, you, might, you won't have the complete picture. You won't have the full picture. So that's why it's important to examine the whole counsel of God when it comes to the last things. Um, you should be gracious towards others who have other points of view. Um, if, if someone else, if for example, let's say you're a premillennialist and you're talking with someone who is an amillennialist. Well, you might not agree with that person, but you can still be gracious towards that person and accept that person as your fellow brother or sister. And by doing that, you can encourage them to be gracious towards you. Um, so you should hold on to your view with confident humility. Com it, you should be confident in the sense that you have studied this well and you know why you believe what you do, but you should also be humble enough to say, hey, I don't have the full picture. I could be wrong on some things or maybe even many things, okay? So that's what, um, what it means to have confident humility. So how can we um, teach and preach on the last things in a corporate setting as, as teachers and leaders uh, in the church? Okay, well, the first thing we should do is to openly reflect our attitude of confident humility. You know, we should be confident in what we teach, but we should also admit that we could be wrong. That does not mean that we are apologetic about what we teach, that we're wishy-washy about what we teach. No, we should be confident. But at the same time, we should also readily admit that we could be wrong. Okay, so that is, so we should openly reflect an attitude of confident humility. We should encourage others to investigate on their own um, because you know we we need to have be confident that the Holy Spirit can speak through his word to people uh, wherever they are. 
And so we need to encourage others to investigate this topic on their own. And we need to continually talk primarily about the biblical motivation for teaching on the last things. Uh, we looked at those motivations earlier, and um, we need to keep these motivations and these purposes in mind as we keep, preach and teach the last things. Um, so let's, and so those biblical motivations are that it gives us, um, it reminds us of the blessed hope that we have. It gives us comfort and encouragement to face the challenges of life. It helps us to be ready for Jesus is coming because he is coming and we do need to be ready for his return. It can help us to remain faithful and to persevere in our Christian walk. It can help us to avoid being deceived because there is a lot of deception going on about the last things, and we need to be on our guard against these deceptions. And so this is one, one more reason why studying the last things is important. Studying the last things warns us to be ready, and it warns unbelievers that they need to get right with God, that they do not have forever to decide whether or not to follow Jesus. There is a day coming when Jesus will return, and when he returns, he will judge the living and the dead. And then the, that the final a final purpose in preaching and teaching the last things is holy living. Because as we learn about the judgment, that can motivate us to live holy lives. Again, it's not that we earn our way into heaven by holy living, but we live holy lives to please our Savior, to please our Master and King who gave himself willingly for us. The biblical teachings about the last things are tremendously important because they remind us of the blessed hope that we have. At the same time, we've examined some of the potential dangers that come with the topic of eschatology. And that is the technical name for the study of the last thing, eschatology. This is a topic in which we need to seek God's wisdom as we teach these important doctrines to our fellow brothers and sisters. <laughs> 